Inspector Mottoplug of Scotland Yard knew that all those drownings were not accidents, but he had no evidence. It was an easy way for a man to make a living, murder his wives and collect the insurance. Yes, I said, why? For there was more than one murder. Hello, Chris. This is Peter Laurie with an invitation to join us at the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight I bring you a story by Roy Vickers. It's the unusual tale of a man who first murdered in rage, and all the witnesses swore it was an accident. Then he murdered coldly, deliberately, for profit, and each time the victim was his own wife. Listen then to the man who murdered in public. <laughs> The story of the murders starts on the afternoon of June 5th, 1920. George McCartney was celebrating his 21st birthday with a stroll in Ilfracum Park when he caught sight of a young girl named Elsie Mackley on one of the park benches. Elsie had been a servant in the McCartney home five years before. George wasn't likely to have forgotten her. Elsie! Elsie Natalie, I say. Imagine meeting you here. Why, it's Master George. Oh, oh, do excuse me. Calling you that when I ought to say Mr. McCartney now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just leave it at George, shall we? Mm-hmm. Oh, my, you've changed, Elsie. Well, it's been five years since... Since you thrust me with the back of a clothes brush and called me an ugly little brute. Oh, no, really, George. <laughs> oh, I used to be afraid of you, Elsie. You look so dreadfully muscular. Now you're rather pink and white. And, well, you're, you're nice. Thank you, George. <laughs> Perhaps that's because I'm taking a holiday before I look round for another job. Tell me, George, what have you been doing? Well, uh, I left Cambridge uh, by request, of course. Oh. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't do well with my schooling. Got nothing out of it at all except the swimming cup. Uh, now I'm touring with a theatrical company, doing a bit of uh, acting for them. Oh, fancy that. An actor? <laughs> yes. And on my way to a rehearsal this afternoon. Oh. Pa- I say, could I meet you again sometime, Elsie? Oh, I'd like that. Well, how about tomorrow, this time? Perhaps we could go boating. Mm, that would be sporting. <laughs> Shall I row out further, Elsie? Oh, George, let's turn back. You must be close to a mile offshore. Oh, you're not frightened, are you, Elsie? Don't forget I want a swimming cup. <laughs> frightened, whatever of. Matter of fact, you know, I jolly well love to row a bit myself. Mm-hmm. Let me try it, George. I'll row to a shore. Well, if you really want to, Elsie. Mm-hmm. Here, change seats with me. Right. Only be careful. Oh, 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 wait. Wait a moment here. Would you take my bracelet? Oh. Put it in your pocket for me, George. Oh, it looks like a valuable bracelet. Mm, real rubies, they are. Well, I should hate to lose it. Now, here I come. Oh, have a care, Elsie. Oh, you... oh, oh, oh the oar! Oh, George, the oar is over. Yes, I know, I know. I, I, I can't... Oh, I can't take it. I, oh. oh. Don't lean on this side. You're going to tip the boat. Oh, oh Elsie. Oh. Elsie. Oh. Elsie, Elsie, are you all right? I, I'm coming. Now don't struggle. Don't, don't stay away from me. Here, here. Turn the badge on your back. Stay off. Let go of me, you ugly little... No. Ugly little brute. You called me that five years ago. And you struck me. Brute am I. Brute, Oh, you should have said that, my girl. Oh, you, you, you soft, white, mealy little fool. Oh, don't you have a doubt. You she-devil. Oh, say. George McCartney hadn't meant to murder Elsie. But she hit him. 
and called him a brute, as she had when he was 16. And somehow it had all come back to him, the hate and the hurt. So before George knew what he was doing, he collared Elsie by the head from behind and put her under. At the coroner's inquest, George took the risk of implying that he could hardly swim at all, and no one could deny it. Well, I, I came up under the upturned boat, and when I got out, I looked around for Elsie. After a bit, I saw her hand come up. I caught hold of one of the oars and splashed up to where I'd seen her, and I got her. I can't remember how I got back to the boat because, well, I, I'd swallowed a lot of water myself. Obviously, an unfortunate accident, Mr. McCartney. But I trust, Mr. McCartney, sincerely trust, that you've learned a terrible lesson which will stay with you the rest of your life. Oh, yes, sir. One does not stand up in small boats, Mr. McCartney. George walked away from the coroner's inquest a free man, not a care in the world, not even the burden of a guilty conscience. And a few days later, looking through the coat he had worn the afternoon of the drowning, George discovered... Hello, what's this? Well, I say... A bracelet. Elsie's ruby bracelet. Within a year, George was in financial difficulties. George wasn't very successful as an actor. In fact, after trying numerous other jobs, he discovered he wasn't very successful at anything. With... One exception. And George made a career of that exception before he was through. I committed murder and gotten away with it. What fools murderers are to be caught? Messing around with poison and guns and knives, which always leave clues. But if you have a boating accident, which lots of people can witness, it doesn't matter if you do contradict yourself a bit. They expect to be flooded... And unless they can show that you deliberately upset the bird, there's no possibility of their proving anything. On May 5th, 1923, George McCartney married a pretty little parlor maid named Violet Maystow. And a notable gift from the bridegroom to the bride was the ruby bracelet. On May 9th, he insured her life for 2,000 pounds. And of course, George and Violet made their wills out to each other. And by the middle of August, George was ready to take Violet on their deferred honeymoon. Oh, uh, oh that dashed alarm clock. Uh, oh, sir. Uh, I, I say, I say, Mrs. McCartney, come along. Now, wake up. Oh, leave me be, George. This is oh, Sunday. Here's Violet Sunday. Sunday, remember? Sunday? Oh, Sunday! Oh, now tell me, George. <laughs> now you must go on. What's the surprise? <laughs> tell me. Oh, no, no, no. Pack your things, Violet. I know. We're going to Bogner for a fortnight on our honeymoon. <laughs> Bogner. Yes, darling. Bogner. Where we can go boating. <laughs> And for the benefit of some 200 bathers who had witnessed the accident, George wore his best state of collapse expression. At the inquest, he made a very dejected picture as the local coroner spoke to him. <clears throat> There's the little I can say, Mr. McCartney, other than to point out to you the obvious lesson this most cruel experience teaches. A lesson, Mr. McCartney, I sincerely trust you will always remember. One does not stand up in small boats. In September of the same year, when the 2,000 pounds had been spent, George became interested in a sharp-witted little cockney named Madge Turnham. And soon he had arranged, one, his marriage to Madge, two, a 10,000 pound accident policy on her life, and three, a vacation at the seaside resort of Painton. However, Madge had an aversion for both. And George was forced to play his cards carefully. You know, George, I do believe this is the first time we've been happy together. Oh, you're precious. I wish we could go boating, Madge. It's such fun. Oh, George, you know I hate boating, I do. 
I should be seasick in no time. Oh, come, come now. I have it. You've been after me for a fiver. Well, I wager you a fiver. You can't stay in the boat with me for an hour. Just one little hour. A fiver? Yes, a fiver, old girl. What say? It'll buy you that spotting suit you wanted. It would. I say, I'll go it. Come along. Oh, wait. Uh, shouldn't you leave me a real big bracelet behind? <laughs> oh, silly. Of course not. It won't be lost. I'll see to that. The inquest following the accidental drowning of Mad went off without a hit. And George went free. But neither the coroner nor the local police kept index news tippings of other boating fatalities in other years and in other places. But George didn't know that Scotland Yard kept a voluminous file cross-indexed of such accidents. And George hadn't reckoned on Detective Inspector Martel Club. First, the town of Ilfracombe, then Bognor. Now it's painted, all some miles apart, yet all the same way, and the same man. Well, <laughs> Inspector Martel Club, still studying those stuffy accident files. Whatever do you see in them? Murder. Murder? Oh, I say now. Doubt it. Look. These three reports, identical. Three women, all servant girls, drowned. All with a man named McCartney. So? There are hundreds of identical accidents every summer. Two other women, insured. Husbands insure their wives as a matter of course. Perhaps. But I think this McCartney bears talking to. <laughs> Yes. Uh, Mr. McCartney? Yes, I'm George McCartney. Uh, Mr. McCartney, I'm Inspector Marvelplug of Scotland Yard. May I come in? Oh, oh uh, well, <laughs> I was about to leave. Uh, however, Scotland Yard comes first, I'm sure. I'll come straight to the point, Mr. McCartney. Uh, our records reveal that you have had the singular misfortune of being the uh, sole survivor in three drowning incidents. Oh, oh, dear, 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 dear. I... I... I'd rather hope to forget about them. I shouldn't wonder. Can you shed any light on the uh, coincidence? Oh, it fairly beats me, Mr. Martel Plug, and that's a fact. You'd think that after a thing like that happened once, it just couldn't possibly happen again. True. Yes, and, and it used to haunt me. That's why poor Madge persuaded me to go out again, uh, to overcome my awful horror of water. Oh, dear, why talk about it? That's why I've come. To talk about it, Miss McCartney. Oh. Oh, I see. But I do not care to talk about it, Inspector. It's too painful. Not nearly so painful as a rope. I tell you, I cannot discuss it, Inspector. If you don't like that, why don't you arrest me for murder? Why, I... <laughs> I'll tell you why you don't. Because you've got no evidence. You'll never hang me, Martel Plug, because you haven't any evidence and you can't get it. <laughs> Inspector Martel Plug set to work to prove George guilty of deliberately drowning three women, but he soon discovered that there was no real evidence, just coincidence and suspicion, and that made no case. So Martha Plug confined his activities to keeping a check on George's whereabouts. In 1924, George met May Toller outside a servant's registry in Piccadilly and began keeping steady company. And inevitably. Oh, May, May, darling. Why not chuck it all and marry me? Well, uh, I'm not sure, George, that I, I should leave my parents and chuck my job. You tell me you've got money, but... But I've no employment. Uh, what matter? I have enough to care for you, May, and your parents. And I have a surprise for you tonight. A surprise, George? Yes. Something I've kept all these years for just such a girl as you, May. Here. By whom? What a beauty. I have always loved bracelets. And, George, it's rubies. Where did you get it? 
It... It belonged to my mother. So they were married. And George took out a £10,000 accident policy on May and set up their new quarters in Theobald's Road. There, before very long, Inspector Martleplug arrived one day to let the new Mrs. McCartney in on a deadly secret. Oh, sorry to trouble you, sir. I want to see the McCartneys. I understand they have rooms here. Why, I saw Mr. and Mrs. McCartney leave early this morning. Oh, do you happen to know where they went? Why, yes. Mrs. McCartney was that excited, she told everyone. They've gone boating at Grand's End. Boating? Boating? Quickly, how do I get to Grand's End? Inspector Martelplug arrived at the bathing beach in time to see a crowd gathering as the beach keepers ran up on shore, carrying the limp form of a young woman. Oh, I saw it all. He did his best, he did. And oh, she's still alive. They're trying to save her. Her husband there, poor man, look, he's weeping. Okay, let me through. What happened? Yeah. I think a woman very nearly drowned. Nearly drowned? You mean she's still alive? Oh, yes. They're pumping the water out of her now. Let me in there. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Not. Let me through. Let me through. Let me through. Yeah. Mrs. McCartney. Mrs. McCartney, can you hear me? Now, tell me. Nod your head. Were you held under? Here, how dare you question my wife? Think about you, Mrs. McCartney. Did he hold you under? <sighs> too late, Inspector. She's gone. Yes, too late, McCartney. But you had a few bad moments. Oh, huh? how can you say such a thing? Poor May. Oh, my poor, dearest, darling May. The inquest for May Toller McCartney proceeded as usual until it came time for the coroner's closing speech. Then George got the shock of his life when Inspector Martleplug took the floor. Uh, just a few routine questions, Miss McCartney. Was your wife insured? Oh, yes, yes, I... I believe she had taken an accident policy for £10,000. And did your former wife, Madge Turner, meet with a similar uh, accident at Paynton? Yes, yes, And did uh... you not collect a £10,000 policy in her name? Yes, yes, I did. And did you not have two other similar accidents prior to that? One with Elsie Natley at Ilfracum, and one with your first wife, Violet Lee stole a bogner. I won't answer that. No matter, we know you did. And I have a summons for your arrest for the murder of your wife. Anything you say from this moment on may be held against you. But George had enough money to hire one of England's most promising young lawyers, Ernest Quilter. Quilter had no use for his client, but he made a brilliant case against the Crown. In, uh, in this case, there's no assumption of guilt, whatever. There is only the overwhelming assumption of an accident. Oh, George, oh, my Lord, my Lord. Brown Barrister has something to say? Yes, my lord. The deceased was drowned, admittedly, within a dozen or so yards of the upturned boat. Is it to be believed that the prisoner, who was a very able swimmer, having won a cup for swimming at Cambridge, is it possible that he was unable to effect her rescue, as he stated? Uh, I object, my lord. It is no part of my case to deny that my client could have saved his wife from drowning had he wished to do so. My learned friend has forgotten more law than I ever knew, so... He will not object to my reminding him of the principle enshrined in the doggerel. Thou shalt not kill, but needs not strive officiously to keep alive. Now, I admit that George McCartney did not strive to keep his wife alive. I'm not here to defend his moral character nor his conscience. I'm still waiting for my friend to show that any action of McCartney's betrays evidence of felonious intent. <laughs> At the judge's direction, the jury found George not guilty. There the case ended, with no one in England doubting George's guilt and no one able to do anything to him. And then one day, a certain Mrs. Hasterton, just returned to England from Canada, telephoned the local police to report... A burglary, yes. That's right. They've taken not only all our silver, but my jewels as well. A lion crouching. That's right, it's our family crest. Yes, and it's stamped on every piece. What's that? Yes, the crest is on both the silver and the jewellery. 
And a few days later at Scotland Yard... Inspector! Inspector Martelplug! Uh, yes? Uh, what is it, Morton? Uh, I have a pawnbroker outside who has recovered a stolen ruby bracelet. The bracelet bears the high Stephen crest. Stolen jewelry? Are they in my department, Morton? But, but, but wait! The pawnbroker says the bracelet was pawned by George McCartney. And that same afternoon... That's why we called you, Mrs. Heistephan. We want to get this thing straightened out. I'm so sorry you've had this trouble with the bracelet, Inspector Martelplug, but it's not one of the stolen pieces. I gave it away as a present when I was in England six years ago. I'm very sorry she had to pawn it. Huh? Who had to pawn it, Mrs. Heistephan? The girl I gave it to. She was one of my maids, and I gave it to her because she saved my life. Her name was Elsie Lackley. <laughs> We are ready to hear the grand cancel. My lord, we wish to introduce proof that George McCartney is guilty of murder. <laughs> Mrs. Heistephan, will you take the stand, please? Mrs. Heistephan, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, I help you, Rod? I do. Take the stand, please. My lord, the defendant claims that none of the four girls who went boating with him could swim. These are his sworn statements. Now, Mrs. Heistephan, is this the bracelet you gave your maid, Elsie Natley, six years ago? Yes. Mrs. Heistephan, why did you give Elsie this ruby bracelet? Because she saved my life. <laughs> Mrs. Heistephan, how did Elsie save your life? It was at our summer home. I was in bathing and had been caught by a strong current. Elsie heard me cry for help from the house some 200 yards off. And she swam to my rescue outstripping other would-be rescuers who were much closer to me. She was a magnificent swimmer. <laughs> Elsie Natley, my lord, was a magnificent swimmer. She drowned because she was held underwater by that foolish little fiend. This, George McCartney who thought that public murder was foolproof. On June 6th, 1925, just five years to the day after he started on his career of crime, George McCartney was hanged for the murder of Elsie Natley. <laughs> McCartney murderer. You see, George McCartney didn't save money, and to his twisted mind, the only means to a fortune was death by drowning. Oh, but a wise man doesn't get himself into that kind of a spot. He skims the cream off of his pay and stashes it away in soldiers' deposits at the office of his CO. See how simple it is? You don't have to marry for a while. Just save your money. Oh, yes, and don't murder anyone, please. Now, about our next production in a mystery playhouse. It's one of those great stories by Craig Rice concerning the adventures of John G. Malone, the lawyer who conducts the major proportion of his criminal investigations at Joe the Angel's Bar. Let's visit the green room where the actors are preparing a scene for our next attraction. Follow me. Hmm? Come, come. That's me, John J. Malone. Never lost a client. Just around the corner here. Hey, wait a minute. I got it. That what? That's a word. Uh, some of them, anyhow. Um, when they hanged him in the morning, his last words were for you. Then uh, the sheriff took his shiny knife and cut that old rope through. Yes, sir. Yeah, I never heard that song before. This is Palmer's cell right here. Hey, Palmer, you're Lloyd. Holy mackerel. Malone, look. Palmer's hung himself. What? With me for a lawyer? Oh, my Lord. Still alive. Well, then, get the door open. Come on, hurry it up, will you? All right. Hurry. All right, now, cut him down. Cut him down quick. 
But he's still breathing. Well, he must have been out of his mind. What, do he want to go and hang himself with a new trial coming up and everything? Easy. Next. Okay, okay, let him down. That's it. All right. That's about it. Put him on the bunk there. Okay. Okay. Palmer. Palmer. This is Malone. What happened, kid? Trying to say something. Palmer. Palmer, it's Malone. Go on. What wouldn't break? It wouldn't break. Palmer. Palmer. Well, he's gone. Dead. Hangs himself in the death house. Just when maybe he's going to be set free. Oh, but was it suicide? It is very strange that a man who was going to inherit two million dollars would hang himself, especially when he was to be freed from a death house the next day, helping himself freely to the contents of a bottle at Joe the Angel's Bar. John G. Malone considers the problem. His conclusions are startling, and his hangover is terrific because John G. Malone mixes his lie with Jim. Who said this wasn't a horror program? Until next time, then, this is Peter Law closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. Armed Forces Radio Service.